Hello everyone, this is Rebecca Ferreira and I am going to be talking to you today um, about an just an introduction to what philosophy is, um, talk about the Bertrand Russell reading, Value of Philosophy, and then provide a little bit of an overview for the introduction to logic. So to start off with some terminology, um, first things first, regardless of which philosophy class of mine you are in, I uh, always operate under the presumption that students do not have any prior familiarity with philosophy. So if you do, that's just an added bonus. Um, so under that presumption, philosophy as a uh, literal definition comes from the Greek word philosophia, which I thought I had um, here, but I do not. Uh, I think I might have it in some other PowerPoints, depending on which class you're in. But um, philo means to love and sophia means wisdom. So in Greek, right, this was referring to that sort of um, ancient lifestyle of sort of being inquisitive and asking questions and uh, people unfortunately are not as easily able to make a lifestyle of that today um, uh, with myself as a possible exception but um, you know people typically in this line of work might uh, end up being coming lawyers right uh, working on hospital ethics boards um, being hired at uh, think tanks right coming up with policy ideas the basic idea right uh, is thinking outside the box which is often why uh, critical thinking skills are so closely aligned with philosophy but that again refers to philosophy as a way of living. The academic discipline of philosophy is a little bit different in the sense that um, it's something that one can study without actually having uh, to practice, right? So unfortunately, we all know that just because someone has um, a lot of knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that they live by right what they know. And so as an academic discipline, um, philosophy has lots of different definitions. Uh, you probably couldn't get any two philosophers to agree on the same definition but we're going to operate with um, a basic sort of simple understanding that will help govern uh, the way that we approach the class. And so that is the study of general and fundamental problems in the form of questions, right? So what that means is that we're going to be looking at issues, right? So unresolved issues in the world, although oftentimes philosophers might even ask questions to things that we think are resolved, right? Things that we haven't even thought to question. Um, so sometimes it's a matter of uncovering, right? Problems that no one even knew was there. And then again, approaching them by asking questions. And so this ends up being an important part of understanding what philosophy is, but it's also something I want to focus in on because I think it will help us get an idea of what we can expect to get from this class. So what I mean by that is that in a typical class, say if you were taking a math or science class in college, right, your instructor asks you a question and there's usually one right answer. And the idea is that the instructor will teach you how to get from that question to the answer so that you can apply it in new situations. Philosophy even though it too deals in questions is different and often frustrating because we don't often know what if any answers there are or if we do we don't know which is the correct answer and so philosophy is often left with um, the very very frustrating task of dealing with those questions which have yet to be resolved of, of which there is yet to be a satisfying consensus about and so because of that philosophy is uh, really um, I know people like to say uh, physics right is the mother of all disciplines but philosophy is quite literally the parent of all academic disciplines in that it was the first form of higher education. So in ancient Greece, right, um, we had individuals of the upper uh, class, right, these would have been um, the uh, Athenian men, uh, white, right, very privileged, who were capable of hanging out in the agoras and the marketplaces during the day and asking questions. Um, and so these individuals, right, would often go into politics and become great leaders and carry great, great sway. Um, and so asking those questions, right, is going to be uh, at the very foundation. But as we started to, of course, improve in our technology and make progress, right, the idea was that we were 
sort of answering these questions, right? Not everything was going to remain a mystery, and that's how sciences emerged, right? Scientists used to be called natural philosophers. It's how psychology emerged, right? As well as other uh, other areas, uh, social sciences and whatnot. So as you'll see in uh, the Bertrand Russell reading, right? Everything in academia emerged when we had an answer to the question. So philosophy today is really just the remaining unanswered questions. And so again, to tie this, you know, to your overall education, you know, if you think about all the different degrees that you can get in college, the highest degree that you can get is a PhD. And most people don't even realize that that means that you are, no matter what discipline you enter into, becoming a doctor of philosophy if you earn the highest degree possible, right? So everyone who has a PhD is a doctor of philosophy regardless of their discipline, because again, right, those questions that they are answering emerged from the philosophical discipline. So if you're an inquisitive person, I'm hoping that you will uh, really enjoy this class, but we do have to be ready for, again, that frustrating point, which is that we might not be able to have those solid answers to the questions. And we'll talk about that more with Russell. So what is a philosophical question? Well, what we typically mean is something that arises from the critical examination of our ordinary beliefs. And I'll talk about that more in a second. But the basic idea, again, is that we're looking at things that are maybe most often taken for granted, that maybe we have made presumptions about or just accepted at face value without ever having even wondered about, let alone questioned in a critical fashion. And by critical here, we don't mean, you know, in a nasty sort of way. We mean in that we are critiquing, we are being uh, inquisitive and curious, right? Intellectually curious. We're human beings with a rational mind, right? And so we want to understand the world around us. And so asking questions in philosophy is going to be an absolute necessity. And I should stop here for another moment, because in the day and age that we're in, many people often think that asking questions is a form of insult. But it needs to be very clear right away that asking questions in philosophy is not only necessary, but it's actually a form of flattery. So imagine if you were trying to share a position with someone about something that you really cared about, right? It could be political, it could be religious, it could be anything, right? So pick pick something that, you, that you're passionate about, right, that you really care about, and imagine telling someone what you believe and why you believe it. What would it mean if they did not ask you any questions about the thing that you just shared with them? Wouldn't that suggest that perhaps that they're not very interested in what you said? That they don't want to know anymore or that it's not uh, even worth following up with further with further information about, right? If if I have something I care about, I you know, I I don't know about you, but I could talk about it all day. I would want to answer any and every question I possibly could. And if it were something as meaningful to me as say a political or a religious belief, I would want to be able to have an answer prepared for any question I might receive. Right? I would I would be rather embarrassed if I were so passionate about something and someone asked me a question and I was like Oh, I, I don't even know. I hadn't even thought about that, right? That doesn't really express the kind of passion that I think I would have had for that subject, right? So again, the basic idea here, something we should learn and hopefully internalize through this class, is that asking questions is a an important necessity, but that it's a good thing, right? That we're doing this and we're going to learn how to do this in a respectful manner that is effective and progressive and moving towards uh, something. All right, so what are we moving towards? Well, like we said, right, looking at somewhat uh, what we might call ordinary beliefs, right, those things that we don't necessarily question all the time. So a philosophical belief, right, is going to be something that is sort of like the foundation for our ordinary beliefs. So for example, right, a common uh, contemporary debate is about um, the ethics of eating meat, right? You'll see I use this example quite a bit just because there's, uh, there's I think most people are familiar with the general uh, arguments on, on either side of the, the debate, uh, or there are many sides of the debate, I guess. And so the idea here, right, is that you might think that eating meat is fine, right? Or you might think that eating meat is morally impermissible. But, right, the philosophical question is why, right? What is it that makes eating meat fine, morally permissible, or not 
okay, right? Morally impermissible, right? So that philosophical question of why in this case will get at the philosophical belief, right? That thing that might underline why you think it's okay to do one thing rather than another, right? So for instance, if I think that it's morally permissible to eat meat, that might be based on a philosophical belief I have that say animal pain or suffering is of less moral value than human pain and suffering, right? Or if I think that animals should not be eaten, that might be based in a philosophical belief that I think that any being that suffers is equally valuable, right? So there are different arguments I could take, right? What we're getting at, again, is not just the, th the point of arguing with each other and you know, oh, I want you to change your mind and you're right and you're wrong. The idea is to really understand why we think what we do, right? And so this, again, is something worth clarifying. Um, when I went to college, my parents uh, warned me, you know, about being brainwashed by, by teachers and things. I want to make very clear that I am not, and don't take this the wrong way, I am not concerned with what your beliefs are, right? In the sense that you can believe whatever you'd like, right? That's, that you're entitled to that. But I am concerned with why you have certain beliefs over others in the sense that I want to help you understand what makes a good reason for accepting something versus what doesn't count as a sufficient reason, right? And learning how to assess those, those things is really useful to us in so many different facets of our lives, but because it can touch on such personal beliefs, right, like some of the things I've mentioned and some that you'll see throughout the class, right, people can, again, often be very... Um, uh, concerned, right, or hesitant, right, to, to question those things. It's not something we've unfortunately been encouraged to do uh, as adults, right? Kids ask lots of questions, but then we as adults get annoyed with them, right? So we're thinking here, right, we're hoping to get to the truth of those philosophical or fundamental or foundational beliefs, right? Is it actually true that a human life, right, uh, matters more? than in a non-human life, right? Is, is that actually true? And if so, again, why is that true, right? What is it that makes human life more valuable? I would have to, you know, find something about humans that, uh, that you know, accounts for all human beings. So for instance, uh, I couldn't say, for instance, that the thing that makes human beings superior to animals is language, right? I, why couldn't I say that? Well, not all human beings have the capacity for language. And a lot of animals actually have quite impressive capacities for language. They can communicate across species. Humans can't even do that. So in, if I were to use something like that, you could see that if I were to follow it through, right, if I really understood the implications of my belief, then I would arrive at an inconsistency, right? I would actually, sh I should, if it's about language, think that humans are superior. I'm sorry, uh, that animals are superior, right? To to humans. So you can see that the idea here is that we want to make sure that we don't hold inconsistent beliefs, or at least, I don't know about you, I don't. I, I don't want to go about in the world uh, thinking things that are um, incompatible with each other, right? I, I, I want to believe true things. I want to make sure that I can be successful in the world, and I can only do that by understanding the world as it is. All right, and so what we are hopefully also able to uncover throughout this process are biases that we have. And, um, you know, there's lots of discussion on different types of biases. If you're in a critical thinking class, um, you know, we'll learn more about that. But the basic idea is that everyone has biases, right? So we can just get that out of the way. We all have them. I have them. You have them, right? <laughs> these, these come in all different shapes and forms. And they are uh, really, they serve a lot of different uh, evolutionary purposes, right? There's, there's some fascinating studies about why, why, why we have these biases. But the important thing to understand is that certain types of biases can create obstacles to making sure that we are thinking clearly and critically and consistently in all the different ways that I've just talked about, right? And so if we want to make sure that we're thinking well, we need to engage in sort of a self-monitoring, right? We need to pay attention to moments where we could be slipping up, right? Because we are fallible. We all make mistakes, right? We've all believed things that have turned out to be false. I'm sure most of you, hopefully all of you, have different beliefs now, for instance, than you did when you were a five-year-old kid, right? Uh, I think you should be proud, right? <laughs> that you have different beliefs than you did when you were five years old, right? We're not usually, um, you know, 
in, in the mindset that knowledge is something that should remain stagnant, right? So if we accept that, then we should really open ourselves up to something that we might call an intellectual humility, right? That we acknowledge that we don't know everything, right? And that some things that we believe might in fact be wrong, just as in the past we have been mistaken, right? And so accepting that will help again to make this process a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier, right? A little bit less uncomfortable, right? If we are willing to help lower some of those barriers that commonly get put up in everyday discourse. All right, so. The focus of philosophy thus, as I've laid out, is really a practice, right? It's a skill that you're going to be building that I hope that you will find useful in really every area of your life, right? So it's again, it's not just the content that you're going to be learning, but it's a way of engaging with the world through questions and issues that otherwise might have gone unnoticed. So some questions that we might come across in philosophy will include questions about um, areas known as epistemology, right, or the study of knowledge, right? So for instance, uh, the difference between me believing that the sun will rise tomorrow and actually knowing that the sun will rise tomorrow, right? I. I can't actually know it because it hasn't happened yet, but I believe it, right? So what will it take to actually know it? And if I can't know anything that will happen in the future, right? Well, what does that mean for science, right? Laws of nature, which make generalizations, right? So you can see that a simple question, right, about what knowledge it is can open up really uh, incredible sorts of implications in other areas, right? So that leads us into, like I said, with science, questions about reality, right? What, it, what exists, what those things are like, that's known as metaphysics. This can lead us into questions about specific types of entities that might exist, such as a divine being or a god, right? The questions which uh, we encounter in areas like philosophy of religion. We could also ask questions related to human existence, right? So not just the nature of how we exist or what we're like, but what the purpose of that existence might be, right? And so we have questions about whether or not life has meaning. And if so, what that meaning could be. This uh, comes across in areas like existentialism. Then the most relevant probably area of uh, philosophy outside of logic, right, and learning how to argue is learning how to make ethical judgments, right? Understanding what is morally right and wrong. Uh, these are questions that everyone will have to make uh, or decisions that everyone will have to make in their life. And, you know, if you're the kind of person who wants to do the right thing, you might want to know what to do or uh, have some tools that might help you if you come across a dilemma where the right thing is not very clear. Right? So philosophy both is and can be, right? critical, again, in the sense that we're asking questions, but constructive, right? We're not asking questions just to be a pain in the butt, right? We're asking questions to try to get at some of these foundational truths such that we can then reason back to see if the implications of those truths are consistent with what we believe, how we act, and if not, then we make corrections going forward. Right? And so as such, we need to have these analytic and thoughtful tools of logic, right? which is that codification of rules for correct reasoning, which we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, shortly. And even though philosophy historically has been uh, predominantly uh, male, right, uh, upper middle class, wealthy, and white, Hopefully, right, philosophy is changing much like uh, many disciplines in that it's becoming more communal and more diverse, right? Is that we're, we're uh, getting more individuals in positions where they can have the platform to ask questions that again, maybe homogenous groups throughout history hadn't thought to ask, right? So what we're going to be analyzing, right, is not just truths, but also truths about what we value, right, things that might be a little bit more subjective, right, things that you can't necessarily value or verify, I should say, in the outside world. And so through analyzing and asking those questions, right, we can hopefully improve upon those values as well, right, by clarifying the concepts themselves, again, making sure that it's not just what we believe, but why we believe it, that we have established sufficient reasons for believing something, right? So there are good reasons and bad reasons for believing in things, right? So for example, if I did think there was 
going to be, say, a thunderstorm tomorrow, a good reason or a better reason for believing that might be, say, a reliable weather forecast. Whereas a bad reason would be to say, well, I had a dream that tomorrow there was going to be a thunderstorm, right? And so it's not just the mere having of reasons, but learning how to assess what might be better or worse reasons for believing things. And as we're going to see with Bertrand Russell, understanding that our beliefs are connected to our actions. So while we might think that people can believe whatever they want, we also understand that people cannot do whatever they want, right? To the extent that we usually at least place restrictions on people harming others. And so if our beliefs are connected to our actions, we're gonna to wanna to take a look at those, right? Even if other people aren't judging them to make sure that we ourselves are making sure we're proud of the things that we believe and thus the things that we do. And so through that, uh, to that end, we're gonna be constructing and critiquing arguments, right? So constructing our own arguments, learning how to reconstruct other people's arguments, learning how to critique others as well as our own, right? Again, for the purpose of scrutinizing our foundational assumptions to arrive, hopefully, potentially, at some sort of truth. So philosophy's norms, again, as I mentioned in the case of arguing, can be different from some of the things we might encounter every day in that philosophy, again, requires us to ask challenging questions. But as I noted before, this is a sign of respect, not of insult. But more importantly than asking those questions is listening to the response. I'm sure we've all had conversations with people who we can tell when you're talking, they're not really listening, they're just waiting for their turn to talk again. We don't wanna be those people, right? We wanna be individuals that have an actual dialogue with each other, okay? And so when we're engaging in that response, right, we are doing it with that critical lens, again, not in, uh, in a mean, right, mean-spirited way, but such that we can find any potential weaknesses, faulty reasoning or unjustified assumptions, that we can make them stronger, right? It's not just about tearing down, but rebuilding, right? We wanna swap out those weaknesses for strengths, right? And so by we can only really do this by engaging in that criticism. Otherwise, we can't find those, those weaknesses. And so because of that, we have to engage in this criticism for ourselves as well as others, right? And again, this is what makes it a communal activity, which is hopefully what we'll be engaging in through our weekly discussions. All right, so this leads me to The Value of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell, which is um, the last chapter of a book he has on the problems of philosophy. And so I like to start off my philosophy courses with this, again, just because I think it helps to clarify what we're doing in the class as well as gives us a realistic expectation so that we can approach the content in a way that's not entirely frustrating. And so uh, to start us off, just a little bit of a uh, introduction. If you had a chance to look at the media, you might have seen uh, Russell in an interview, but he is your stereotypical philosopher, an old uh, deceased white uh, British guy. He's got uh, the elbow patches and the pipe and the British accent. And so, uh, right, he uh, didn't though live as long ago as some of the the ancient philosophers right so he's a little bit more recent but you'll note that even his writing style is a little out of date so i'll uh, do my best to help walk you through this reading as an example um, to also help you get a sense of how to engage in philosophical uh, reading philosophical texts because they can be a little bit difficult if they're written uh, from a long time ago even if they're written in the same language that we speak natively so Bertrand Russell himself was a British philosopher, but as I mentioned, with the history of academic philosophy, he did many other things. He was a historian, a logician, a mathematician, as well as a political activist, and he was very prolific. So if you, if you like any of his philosophy, you can pretty much find writings from him on every major area except for aesthetics, for some reason, the theory of art and beauty. Apparently he didn't have anything to say about that. I'm not sure why. Didn't have enough time. <laughs> Didn't have enough time, right? It's only so many years in one's life. But uh, one of the other important things to uh, touch upon his influence is with the foundation of analytic philosophy. So after we talk about Russell's paper, we're going to talk about the uh, basic uh, introduction to logic, right? And so this is one of two general ways we can approach uh, the discipline of philosophy, the analytic versus the continental approach. So analytic philosophy is basically the idea that we can assess a philosopher's argument independently of the context in which they lived, right? That the details of their personal life, right? Their personal idiosyncrasies, the uh, socio-political goings on at the time that while those might provide, you know, interesting details, right? And uh, background that they are not 
necessarily um, used to assess the, the uh, validity or strength of the argument itself, as opposed to continental philosophy, which uh, makes the, the exact opposite case, right, which is that we cannot extract an argument from its context, right, and so we would need to uh, take all those things into account. And so um, the reason that we are going to be uh, preferring uh, the analytic approach is merely for the purposes of objective grading, right, I have to uh, grade you for this class, and so it's a lot easier to to use those mechanisms um, from uh, analytic philosophy to make sure that that criteria is clear. Okay, so a little bit of uh, history about that. So again, uh, this one's I'm going to walk you through some of the actual passages from the reading. I won't normally do this, but just to give you a sense again of how we can hopefully unpack some writing that is otherwise a little bit unfamiliar to us. So this is again the last chapter in a book he has where he's talked about many problems in philosophy. So he says, having now come to the end of our brief and very incomplete review, of the problems of philosophy, it will be well to consider in conclusion what is the value of philosophy and why it ought to be studied. It is the more necessary to consider this question in view of the fact that many people under the influence of science or of practical affairs are inclined to doubt whether philosophy is anything better than innocent but useless trifling, hair-splitting distinctions, and controversies on matters concerning which knowledge is impossible. So, what he's saying here, right, is that he has covered a number of problems with the area of philosophy, uh, some of which I have mentioned already, right? It has predominantly uh, been a very undiverse field academically, right? And because of that, uh, certain approaches, right, Western, Christian, and the like have been preferred over other philosophical disciplines. But there are other issues that philosophy has had um, just by its very nature of dealing with uh, abstract concepts, right? People think that uh, philosophy is very removed from the, the real world, right? That it has no application. It's just a bunch of people sitting around and, you know, uh, spinning wild tales and crazy ideas all day. And while, in a sense, that might be part of what is occurring, right, what he's really getting at at the end here is that this view of philosophy, that is the view that it is useless, right, just a bunch of people sitting around talking about crazy ideas, that this results partly from a wrong conception of the ends of life, that is partly from a wrong conception of the kind of goods which philosophy strives to achieve. So here's a perfect example of a phrase I have highlighted here, which we could misunderstand, right? So wrong conception of the ends of life. He's not talking here about the end of your life, right? He's not talking about like views of the afterlife. What he's saying is that when you find things like philosophy useless, that is because you have the wrong priorities, right? So the ends of life here, he's like talking about like a means to an end, your goals, the things that we're aiming for, right? And so if you value or prioritize the wrong things, right? If you're aiming for the wrong things in your life, of course you're not gonna find philosophy valuable, right? So he's kind of setting up the idea that if you don't get what doing philosophy uh, means, right? If you don't get why it's worthwhile, we might need to start off by looking at what are the things that you do find worthwhile, right? Are those even the places that you should be starting from, okay? So if we are not then to fail in our endeavor to determine the value of philosophy, we must first free our minds from the prejudices of what are wrongly called practical people. Now, the uh, original text, you can see I've edited it here, was uh, what are wrongly called practical men. But again, right, when we have, um, uh, I'm going to try to replace gendered language with uh, its more contemporary gender neutral alternatives, right, whenever possible. But please note that when um, philosophers use men or man, they're often referring to everyone, right? They're just using it, uh, they're, they're using um, uh, masculine language, right, uh, in a way that is meant to generalize, but uh, we might often mistake that to just be men, but they really were trying to refer to everyone. Now, the idea here is that, right, these practical people, typically in society, we find that to be a good thing, right? Practicality is something positive. We like when something has a practical application, right? It usually means that it's useful in some way. 
So, he thinks that practical people are, have been titled so wrongly, right, that they have prejudices. So something that we typically think of as good, practical, he actually means in a very negative way, right? And so he's going to elaborate that on the next sentence. The practical person, as this word is often used, is one who recognizes only material needs, who realizes that people must have food for the body, but is oblivious of the necessity of providing food for the mind. So here he is delineating between two types of goods or ends right? Types of things that people might strive for. We have goods of the body and goods of the mind, right? And so he's saying that practical people are concerned with goods of the body, but do not see any need for goods of the mind, right? And so you can probably see where this is going, right? Philosophy as an abstract concept is going to be a good of the mind, right? Not a good of the body, at least under this common misconception, right? And so if people don't see it as a good of the body, then they're not going to value it at all, right? In other words, this is him criticizing materialism, right? The idea that people are only concerned with stuff, right? Having all the stuff that they can get. Why do you want to get a college degree? So that you can get a good job. Why do you want a good job? So that you can make lots of money. Why do you need lots of money? So you can buy lots of stuff, right? And I don't know if any of you are familiar with the uh, uh, deceased uh, late comedian uh, George Carlin, but he has a wonderful uh, stand-up video on this stuff. If you are bored <laughs> in this uh, COVID-19 crisis and need need something to go watch, right? Please, please entertain yourself with that, right? But the basic idea is that we can't even, you know, even having a house full of stuff around us is often not enough. People have storage units full of stuff, right? And the idea is that when you look back on your life, right, if we can imagine the end of our lives, do you think you're going to be looking back and, and regretting or wondering about or even thinking about all the stuff that you had, right? Oh, I'm so glad I got that thing or, you know, that latest iPhone. And Oh, I'm so bummed I didn't have a chance to get that one other thing. You know, I think most people realize that that stuff in the end doesn't ever really matter, but it seems to be the thing that everyone is encouraged to strive for. Right? And so this is, this is one of those basic, ordinary beliefs that a philosopher is trying to get us to question, right? Well, why should that be the primary end, right? Why do I need to aim for the big house with the big car, right? Maybe something different, right? Maybe other things will make my life more valuable, right? So he gives us a little thought experiment next. If all people were well off, right, if poverty and disease had been reduced to their lowest possible point, there would still remain much to be done to produce a valuable society, right? I think most people would agree with that, right? Just having your basic bodily needs met is not sufficient. And even in the existing world, where we don't have enough even for most people, right, the goods of the mind, he says, are at least as important as the goods of the body. So let me make this clear. If any of you have taken a psychology class, maybe or you're familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, which says that we need to address the goods of the body, right, the basic elements of survival before we can address other aspects of health, right, and uh, flourishing, right, like mental health and emotional health. And so the idea here is that Russell is not saying that, you know, the goods of the mind are more important than the body right? He's just saying that we shouldn't have to postpone achieving the goods of the mind while we are achieving the goods of the body, right? We don't need to wait to get those met in order to get the others. They are at least equally valuable, right? That just having one is not going to be sufficient. And that goes the other way too, right? So he's not going to say that people who only value the goods of the mind are going to be the most, you know, praiseworthy. Because if you only get value the goods of the mind, you're not going to live very long, right? You can't, you know, deny the, the needs of the body to survive. So he's saying that it needs to be in a sort of equilibrium here. But he says, it is exclusively among the goods of the mind that the value of philosophy is to be found, right? So he doesn't think that philosophy is going to have this tangible value. Um, and that's actually something I would, I would wager to disagree with him on. And you'll see at the end of the quarter, um, I provide you with some statistics about there are actually some interesting tangible benefits to studying philosophy. Now, of course, Russell wouldn't have had access to, you know, the sort of data, 
But um, you know, it's it's a I think a good comment to make that while Russell thought that philosophy is only valuable to the mind, some might suggest that engaging in this work can actually have tangible material benefits as well, right? But Russell thought it was just in the value of the mind. Okay, and finally he says, only those who are not indifferent to these goods can be persuaded that the study of philosophy is not a waste of time. Now that might be you, right? Maybe you chose this class just because it fit with your schedule, not that there are even any schedules anymore, but maybe you picked this class because you thought, hey, if I got to take an elective, maybe I want to take something that's actually interesting to me, right? That you saw a value in studying something for its own sake, right? I think that's sort of what he's getting at here. Okay, so this value that philosophy has, this good of the mind, right? He said is different, right, than goods of the body, which have utility, right, like in the natural sciences. And so that kind of utility, right, that good of the body, that material use, does not, he says, belong to philosophy. The study of philosophy has any value at all for others than the students, right, for any people other than you. He says it must only be indirectly through its effects upon the lives of those who study it. So I mentioned earlier how Russell's going to start talking about the connection between our beliefs and our actions, right? So philosophy can have a value to you, right, as a good of the mind, but he says, excuse me, it can make its way into the world through your actions, right? So an indirect effect on the world. If again, you allow those changes to occur. But even if you don't allow the changes to occur, right, if you don't assess those beliefs, there's still going to be corresponding effects in the world, right? So action or inaction, right, is going to have those effects. So the value of philosophy is, in fact, he said, to be sought largely in its very uncertainty. Okay, so it's not going to have, he says, this utility. We can't go out into the world and just say, oh, I can go get a job. Now I studied philosophy. I wish it were that easy. The idea, though, is that by engaging in questions of the mind, right, that the questions themselves will give us the value, right? And so he's even going to say that the answers are not the most important part. Okay, so he's going to say that the value of philosophy is to be sought in the questions, not the answers. But even more so, what he's getting at here is that it's almost going to be better to have those questions left unanswered. And I know that sounds weird, but we'll get an understanding of why that is. Okay, so he says the person who doesn't value philosophy, right, goes through life imprisoned in the prejudices derived from common sense. So again, common sense, something that is normally good, seen here as a negative. He thinks common sense is a prison, right? And the reason he thinks it's a prison is because common sense, quote unquote, is derived from what he calls the habitual beliefs of your age or your nation, right? So common sense is really just an appeal to popularity. It's an appeal to what most people believe in any given region at any given time. And what's even worse, right, than this being a prison, right? It's prison because for him it's a construction, it's not actually a bearing on the truth, and you just have to, you know, go throughout history to find any moment in time when a large majority of people believed something that was false, right? We can think of many examples, right? But even worse than believing things just because it's what most people believe is that this next line is that these convictions, right, these beliefs have grown up in our minds without the cooperation or consent of our deliberate reason. What that means is that these beliefs that we hold, this common sense, is stuff that we were told growing up that maybe at one point we questioned, but eventually we stopped questioning or maybe we never questioned it. And so we have maintained those beliefs into our adulthood without even recognizing that they're there, let alone agreeing to them. So here I want to share a, a personal example going back to uh, biases, right? So um, I'll just share that uh, I grew up in Southern California and uh, growing up in Los Angeles, there uh, was definitely um, a, a pretty clear sort of racial distinction in social classes in the area that I grew up in. Uh, it was primarily upper middle class uh, Caucasian families where I lived and most of the uh, people who would come in and uh, 
do uh, gardening work and other types of labor during the day would primarily be of Latinx descent. And so that was just something that, you know, I grew up with that I didn't even think about until I was old enough to travel and, and go somewhere else. I, I had the opportunity to, to go to a study abroad when I was in community college. I got to go to Australia, which I would definitely recommend you go study abroad if you can. But when I got there, um, I was staying with a host family and they were coming to have some work done on the house. And I became aware of this bias. I didn't know I had it until this moment when I opened the door and found myself surprised that the workers were white. And at this moment, I was like, oh, my, like, I didn't even realize that I had had this bias. And I, I was embarrassed about it. But I was so glad that I had been made aware of it, as uncomfortable as it was, right? So it had been there all along and I didn't even know, right? And so these are the kinds of moments I'm talking about. Perhaps you've had them in your life, right? Where we realize that, you know, a lot of what we've been told was maybe false, right? Or at least, you know, was not the whole truth, right? It was a generalization, a stereotype. And so again, we want to make sure that we don't allow any old belief to reside in our mind. You should know what beliefs you hold and you should agree to have them, right? And for good reason. And so if you're not willing to do this, right? Then he says, to such a person, the world tends to become definite, finite, obvious. Common objects rouse no questions and unfamiliar possibilities are contemptuously rejected. So here what he's saying is if we're not willing to question our prejudices, if we're not willing to question common sense, Basically, you're going to be the kind of person who thinks they have everything figured out. Maybe you know someone like this. They think they know everything. They have all the answers. And I want you to think for a moment about how enjoyable it is to be around someone like that, right? We don't like people who act like they know everything because no one knows everything, right? And so we want to, again, try to embrace that intellectual humility. All right, so how does philosophy work, right? How is asking questions gonna help, you know, free us from this prison, as Russell's talking about? Well, he says, as soon as we begin to philosophize, right? Opposite to the person who thinks they know everything, we find that even the most everyday things lead to problems to which only very incomplete answers can be given. For example, right? Uh, I might think about something really common like brushing my teeth, right? seems like an everyday thing, not very problematic. But when I start really thinking about it in a philosophical sense, right, I might think about, okay, well, as an action, surely my it has some sort of consequences. So let me think about the outreaching impacts of me brushing my teeth. Well, in order to even be able to brush my teeth, I had to get my toothbrush from somewhere, right? So we're thinking about, uh, you know, materials, uh, natural resources, perhaps, or artificial ones. We're thinking about manufacturers, the employees, uh, perhaps the environmental toll of shipping certain products. Uh, if I'm talking about a hygiene product like toothpaste, we're talking about uh, animal testing, at least, um, as well as, you know, the place that I bought my toothbrush toothbrush and toothpaste from, you know, they probably have labor, labor uh, practices that are, you know, either good or not so good. They, they pay employees a certain wage. Uh, they treat them a certain way. And then, of course, you know, any runoff from uh, the actual act of brushing my teeth or, you know, disposing of things. So, you know, it might not seem like at first glance that brushing my teeth really involves anybody else, but then we start to think about it and we actually realize that a lot of people are involved. So shoot, now do I have to like, you know, make sure that I get a recycled toothbrush and make sure that the toothpaste that I get is uh, not tested on animals and maybe is uh, made locally. Like this can be very frustrating, right? You can see why people don't enjoy asking these philosophical questions. Now, I don't want, again, that sort of thing to make us frustrated. I don't want it to, to paralyze us, right, with inaction. But the idea, is that somewhere in this process of breaking open this can of worms of questions, Russell thinks the value of philosophy lies, right? So he says here, philosophy, though unable to tell us with certainty what is the true answer to the doubts which it raises, is able to suggest many possibilities which enlarge our thoughts and free them from the tyranny of custom. Okay, so in one way or another, if our life is to be great and truly free, we must escape this prison of our private world, right? So here's where this reading can get especially tricky, right? He starts talking about 
the uh, self and the not self, right? Again, so philosophers sometimes use um, technical or uh, specific language to talk about things that maybe we would know by another name or description. So here, right, Russell is breaking up this dichotomy some more, right, between someone who engages in philosophical contemplation and someone who does not, right? And so by asking those questions, because we don't know one, what the one right answer is, we are forced to explore as many possible answers as we can and to assess the strengths and weaknesses before we make a decision. And so the idea is that if I decide today what the answer to a question is, well, I'm going to be done exploring the possible answers. Whereas if I don't decide, you know, for a month or maybe even a year, I'm going to learn so much more, right, by continuing that exploration. And so what he is actually encouraging us to do is almost remain agnostic in a sense, right, to maintain that uncertainty in the sense that we should not necessarily never think that we know what the right answer is, but at least always be willing to be open to new possibilities, right? That we should never shut ourselves off from a future, potentially better or more accurate answer, right? So true philosophic contemplation finds its satisfaction in every enlargement of not just the world, right? Because we are uh, getting a sense of what the world is like, right? The not self part. But he says also, right? It finds its satisfaction in everything that magnifies the objects contemplated and thereby the subject contemplating, right? So by opening your mind, right, he almost says that you're making yourself larger, right? You're enlarging yourself in this way. And everything then in contemplation that is personal or private, everything that depends upon habit, self-interest, or desire just distorts the object, right? And hence impairs the union which the intellect seeks, right? We're trying to understand the world that we, that we live in and how we're connected to it. So we can only do it by connecting these two spheres, right? We can't keep them separate. So once we open ourselves up to these many possibilities, he thinks this is what it means to be impartial, right? In contemplation. And he says that this is going to be the very same quality, right? This, this desire for truth, which when we act will be just, when we emote, when we have feelings, will result in universal love, which can be given to all and not only those who are judged useful or admirable, right? Surely we don't want to only be valuable insofar as people can get something from us, right? That we value things in and of themselves, right? Thus, again, this contemplation enlarges not only the objects of our thought, but also the objects of our actions and affections. And this is my favorite line of the whole chapter. He says, it makes us citizens of the universe, not only one, uh, sorry, not only of one walled city at war with the rest, right? So in a time when people are literally calling for building walls, right? He's talking about breaking down those barriers that have built uh, been built up really by others around your mind, right? And freeing that. He says, in this citizenship of the universe consists people's true freedom and their liberation from the thraldom of narrow hopes and fears. Philosophy thus is to be studied for the sake of the questions themselves because these questions enlarge our conception of what is possible, enrich our intellectual imagination and diminish the dogmatic assurance which closes the mind against speculation, right? So people who think they have everything figured out are often not interested in asking these questions, okay? So uh, this is even maybe a good uh, life lesson, right? If you are in a situation where you are not able to answer questions or someone is not willing or open to questions, that should be a red flag, right? We need to be able to reason through things and we can only do that with information. All right, so uh, in the next few slides, I mostly just have a sort of an overview of what we just talked about, right? And so um, the next bit is just clarifying those different areas of philosophy. So there's a little bit more here. Um, a little note on the last couple, uh, axiology is the study of valuing. So this includes both aesthetic values, right? For art and beauty, as I mentioned earlier, and moral values. When we study uh, moral values specifically, this area of axiology is called ethics, and we can do normative or descriptive ethics. So normative activities are where we talk about what ought to be the case, and descriptive activities are where we talk about the way things actually are. 
All right, and so the last bit of this is just really to go over some of the few basics of argumentation, All right? So most of this should be picked up from the, uh, the reading, so I'm gonna uh, kind of skip over most of the terminology uh, and focus on some specifics. Okay, so uh, let's clarify the difference between an argument and an explanation. So an argument, very quickly, again, is reasons for thinking that something is the case, right? So uh, that would be different from telling us why or how something is the case. So for example, if I were to explain a rainbow, right, I would tell you why right, certain particles, or how certain particles, right, uh, of moisture in the atmosphere refract light, right, and talk about the color spectrum and all that stuff, right, that's an explanation. That's different from giving you an argument, which would be giving you a reason for thinking that there is a rainbow, or that there is not a rainbow, right, or that uh, that rainbow was created by leprechauns, right, so it's a reason for getting you to believe something, as opposed to an explanation. All right, um, and so arguments can be, uh, can you can make arguments about all kinds of things, but the arguments that we're going to be concerned about in philosophy are going to be those that involve statements which are either true or false and ones that are not both. So an opinion would be an example of something that can be both true and false, right? So I can think that chocolate is the best flavor ice cream. You can think it's not. Neither of us is right or wrong, right? But if we say that the earth is flat, we can disagree, but we can't both be right. Okay, so we're dealing with arguments that have that sort of objective truth value, right? And so arguments in philosophy are going to be composed of two types of statements, premises, or at least one premise, and a conclusion. And then there are going to be different types of arguments. Inductive arguments, which are really about likelihood or probability, and we assess those using terms like strength and weakness. Right? A strong argument, right? a strong inductive argument, means that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is more likely to be true. Then, if we find out we have a strong inductive argument, we can then check to see if the premises of that argument are true in the world. And I'll clarify more on that in a little bit. Right? But the, the big thing here is that we don't check for the actual truth of the premises until the end. And if it turns out we have a strong inductive argument with true premises, that is called a cogent argument. Deductive arguments, on the other hand, are not meant to deal with likelihood or probability. They're trying to instead establish the truth of the conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So they're trying to prove it. Now, in this case, in order to judge its success, we would use terms like valid or invalid, since the uh, truth-preserving nature of deductive arguments really has to do with the structure, so we have different terminology. So valid arguments do not have to do with the actual truth of the premises. If you recall, I said that comes later. Validity just says that if the premises were true, right, then the conclusion must also be true. So if it's the case that if the premises are true but the conclusion could still be false, then you're dealing with an invalid argument, right? And the, uh, excuse me, there are some examples and further uh, explanations in the reading. And again, after we determine whether an argument is valid or invalid or strong or weak, right, the success, then we can check and see if the premises are true. So in deductive terms, if we have a deductively valid argument and it turns out all the premises are true, then that argument is sound. Okay, so um, there are going to be a lots of different argument forms. Um, some of them are listed uh, here as well as in the readings or in some of your textbooks. The other thing that we want to look out for are errors in reasoning. So in some of these classes, we'll cover these in more detail, but there is a list here in case you're interested in finding out more of those. All right, so the last thing I have here is just a quick sort of diagram to help remind you the steps of identifying arguments, right? So first you want to figure out if you're dealing with an argument, right, versus an explanation. So try to find the conclusion, then the premises. Okay, so once you figure it out if you have an argument, then you want to figure out what kind of an argument it is. Right? Is it deductive or is it only trying to establish the likelihood or probability of something? Okay. So note that inductive arguments are actually far more common in the real world. Right? Most of our knowledge comes from inductive reasoning in science. Right? Uh, you know, you are maybe perhaps going to get a treatment and it has an 80% likelihood of success, right? So that seems pretty high, right? But in other cases, we might think that uh, maybe just a 50% likelihood is enough, right? Um, so maybe if you're just, you know, curious about whether a movie's playing at a local theater later, like, oh, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. So 
Induction is the stuff that we encounter all the time, but as we know, inductive arguments can never guarantee the truth of their conclusion. So most of what we know then really still has a likelihood of being false, right? So deductive arguments are much stronger, but they're a little bit more rare. So once we have the kind of argument that we're looking at, we want to figure out if it's successful. Again, if we have a deductive argument, we want to know if it's valid or invalid. Okay, so a valid argument, right? If the premises are true, conclusion has to be true. Invalid argument. Even if the premises are true, the conclusion could still be false. Now notice here that invalid is marked red because if it turns out you have a deductively invalid argument, we don't really care about anything else because the conclusion isn't going to follow from it anyways. Similarly with induction, if we're assessing for strength or weakness, if we have a weak argument, meaning that the premises do not make the conclusion very likely, then we're not concerned any further. But if we have a deductively valid argument or an inductively strong argument, right, strength meaning that, again, if the premises are true, they make the conclusion more likely, then we want to go out and check and see if the premises are true in the world, right? Don't bother with this last step if the conclusion doesn't follow. But if it does, then we want to figure out if they're true. If we have a deductively valid argument with true premises, again, that's sound. If it turns out that the deductively valid argument's premises are not true, even just one of them, then the argument is unsound. Similarly with induction, right? If you have a strong inductive argument, if it has true premises, it is cogent, and if it, at least one of its premises is false, it is uncogent.